Hi guys and welcome. This is Jen Gata Siciliano, artist, memoir writer, bipolar psychiatric survivor, and your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast, the place that offers an alternative perspective on mental illness, highlighting creativity, non-conventional healing, and breaking on through to the other side. If you are ready for a new narrative on the mental realm that celebrates crazy and cool without penalty, then Not As Crazy As You Think is for you. Hello, this is Jen Gata Siciliano, your host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast. Today we have a wonderful guest with us. I'm so happy he could be here. His name is Brian Bogert. He's an inspirational and motivational speaker, calls himself a human behavior and performance coach, a business strategist who's helped many professional athletes, growth-minded individuals, and business executives. Brian, thank you for coming out. And this is so great that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Let's have some fun today. Yes, yes. You uh, have an interesting background and you take your personal journey and you bring it to others. And, you know, just just go for it. Tell us who you are and tell us about what you do. Yeah, perfect. So who I am, I always have to start with. uh, I'm a husband and father first. Those are my absolutely most important roles to my identity. Those are the things that I carry the most joy, freedom, and fulfillment through. So I always have to start there. You know, you had some little titles and things in my intro. I think that covers the rest of it. But how about this? I'll just tell a story to give you some, some context as to, to who I am and what my journeys looked like so that when you realize what I do, you'll understand where it came from. And I'm just going to ask you and everybody who's listening, unless they're driving, of course, just close your eyes for one second. I want you to imagine going to a store, having a successful shopping trip, freezing through the checkout line, heading out the doors, looking up, feeling the warmth of the sun on your skin, the breeze through your hair, head over to your car. And as you're fumbling in your pockets to get your keys to unlock your doors, you turn your head and see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time Mm. to react. Go ahead and open your eyes. Mm. That's where this portion of my story begins. Mm. My mom, my brother, and I went to Walmart to get a one inch paintbrush. And anybody who's known me for more than two and a half seconds can see that I've been an excitement, vigor, and energy for life. So it wasn't a surprise to them that I was the first one in the car. I wanted to get home and put that paintbrush to use. Mm. My mom and brother were a few feet behind me. And, you know, this was back in the days before there was key fobs. So I had to wait for my mom to literally catch up, stick the key in the door, turn it so we could get on our way. And as I was waiting for her to get there, there was a truck that pulls up in front of the store. Driver and middle passenger get out. Passenger all the way to the right feels the truck moving backwards. So he did what any one of us would do, Jen. Scooted over, put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. And if you imagine what any of us would do when we're trying to actually stop a vehicle that's already in motion, we're going to ramp that knee up really high and slam it down, right? All that force that was supposed to go into the brake pedal went right into the gas pedal. Mm. And it threw him up on the dashboard, up on the steering wheel. And before you know it, he was catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at us with no time to react. Wow. Now, we were in an end spot. So he goes up and over the median in the end spot, over the tree, hits our car, knocks me over, runs over me diagonally, leaves a tire track scar on my stomach. Oh my God. Tears my spleen and continues on to completely sever my left arm from my body. It was completely severed. Oh yeah. My mom and brother watched the whole thing happen. They see me laying on the parking lot. They look down and they look up and see my arm 10 feet away. Oh my gosh. And fortunately for me, my guardian angel was also there. There was a nurse mm-hmm. that walked out of the store right when this took place and she saw the literal life and limb scenario that was in front of her. So she rushed immediately into action, which I'm forever indebted to her for doing instead of turning her head and going the other way Mm -hmm. she came over and she stopped the bleeding on the main wound and saved my life and she instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside grab a cooler fill it with ice and get my arm my detached limb on ice within minutes to give me a fighting chance of having my arm reattached so i know you were familiar with my story but i know that i'm sure your listeners were not expecting it to go there today Uh, i know right the reality of it is if she had not come over and done those two things, then I either wouldn't be here with you today or I'd be here with you today with a cleaned up stump. It's amazing. And I realize how unique my story is. But what I also have realized in all the time of doing this is how unique all of our stories are. Mm-hmm. What's important is that we've got to pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. Mm-hmm. And we all have the ability to do that. And we also all have the ability to tap into collective wisdom of other people's stories to shorten our own curve to learning. Mm. So I am going to share with you two primary lessons, and then we'll just jump in and see where it goes. Awesome. The first is I learned early not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but instead get moved by what I can do with it. Mm. And the second lesson, although I didn't realize right away, was one of the more powerful ones that has shaped my life. 
you see it's seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, although I was the one having surgeries, although I was the one going through years of physical and occupational therapy, I was also being guided through the process because I had my parents guiding me. So I was in a fog. Mm -hmm. They were not in a fog. They were intimately aware of the unceasing medical treatments, years of physical therapy. And the idea of seeing their son grow up without the use of his left arm was a source of great potential suffering mm -hmm, for them. Mm -hmm. So they willed themselves day in and day out to do what was necessary, do what was tough, to ultimately embrace the pains required to strengthen and heal me. Mm. But whether it was intentional or not, what they did was they ingrained in me a philosophy and a way of living, which was to embrace pain, to avoid suffering. And I believe when this is done right, that's also when we have the opportunity to gain freedom. You know, it's hard for people to do that. And I think that you probably come up against a lot of people who are resistant to that, embracing pain to find themselves. It's difficult. It, the world literally tells us to reduce the linear or avoid pain, right? Like that's just what happens. We are hardwired as a natural evolutionary response to avoid pain. Right. It used to be a survival technique. It was tr literally fight or flight. A hundred years ago, you cut your leg, you could die. Right. That's just not the reality anymore. Right. And so we've got to better understand this philosophy so that we can really move through it. But, you know, it was, it was these two concepts that I used to not only overcome this unique injury, but how my business partners and I scaled our last business to over 15 million within the span of a decade, how I've actually unpacked my own levels of shame, fear, anger, how we've repaired our relationship with both my wife, my kids over the years by truly turning into those moments of pain so that I could avoid suffering. And it's these things that have committed us to this path because I genuinely believe that when these things take place, that all of us have the ability to flip these things on their head and use them to our advantage by becoming more aware and more intentional so we can get back to who we already are. Like that's why we're on a mission to impact a billion lives by 2045 because I absolutely believe that if we can allow people to experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment holistically by helping them understand who they are more clearly and giving them not just a little nudge, but permission that they can stand on their own two feet and not be accepted just for who they are, but embraced for exactly who they are and know that they are not just confident, but convicted in exactly who they are. I believe that's the path to allowing this world to be a more beautiful place for my kids and my grandkids. Mm. So that's why all of our entities are on this mission to have an impact because uh, I know what it's like to be lost. And I also think that so many of us don't know what to do with our pain. We don't know how to use it for a purpose. We don't know how to move through our emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning. So we end up remaining stuck feeling like we're just a victim in life. Right, right. Now, when you say embrace pain so that you can avoid suffering, how is that like pain and suffering? Isn't that the same yeah. thing? So I don't, I don't believe it is. Uh, I think even if you look up the definition, they're different, but let's better understand what I at least would define them as. You know, pain is defined as short-term intermittent to direct cause from something and alleviate once that direct cause is removed. And then we as human beings screwed up like we do with everything else. And we put adjectives in front of it, like acute and chronic, mm. which inherently changes the definition. Acute maintains it, but chronic changes it because it implies that it's no longer short term and it persists after the direct cause is removed. Right. So let's stop calling that chronic pain and call it what it actually is suffering. You see, pain gets lots of attention. And the reason that I think we like to call things pain is because we really can't measure it independent of the person experiencing it with one final conclusion in that it's a universal human experience. We all experience pain. So we can call it acute and chronic and make it more normal and relate. We don't even want to admit that suffering exists, particularly when it's a direct result of our choices. Mm. But the unavoidable precursor to change is acceptance. So until we accept the current state of things, we cannot alter them. If we understand this concept in theory now, we can embrace the pain of hitting the gym for 30 minutes a day to avoid the suffering of aches and pains of a sedentary lifestyle. Mm. We can embrace the pain of a difficult conversation with a loved one or spouse to avoid the suffering of being stuck in a loveless marriage that's going to end in divorce or ultimately wanting to be in a marriage or get out of a marriage and want the divorce. Right. We can embrace the pain of the difficult conversation and the fit our kids are sure to throw by having them put down their mobile devices at the dinner table mm -hmm. to avoid the suffering of years of lost meaningful connection and conversation we'll never get back. As business owners, we can embrace the pain of firing our top salesperson, contributing the most to top line growth to avoid the suffering of losing all of our other top talent and having stagnant growth because that person was the greatest cancer in our culture. The reality of it is this concept of embracing pain to avoid suffering applies to everything in life. It's about understanding the steps to get there, how to harness this as a habit and everything that we do. And the reality of it is we have to really understand that I believe we all must choose our pain or our suffering will choose us. Mm. I want to be the one that influences and control which direction I can go. Right. It's almost as if you don't do it, then suffering kind of has its own, you know, animal and takes over every time. It's this thing that just grows. You know, it's interesting, though. I mean, embracing pain and, you know, we've all gone through that. And as you know, like now it's crazy to think talks about a lot about mental health and mental illness. And so, so many people who are listening, they also have 
trouble with the pain suffering, I guess, ratio. And you were saying that you have step-by-step way of, of embracing pain. What are some of those strategies that a person can, can do to embrace and, and move on? Yeah. So I'm, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not like a big fan of like stepped programs. I did outline that and I will talk about, there's kind of three philosophical steps to this process, but it's not necessarily like a linear line that you just get to go down and it's just easy. If you follow them, it's, uh, it's free. Right. It's very difficult. Okay. So I want to be really clear on that. Like I am not one of those like seven steps of success kind of guy. We don't need any more of those things. So this is not strategic and tactical. This is more abstract, esoteric, but also very tangible. Okay. There's three ideas and concepts we need to understand around being able to better understand how to embrace pain to avoid suffering. First, we have to acknowledge the suffering we wish to avoid. And that Mm. sounds a little counterintuitive. People are like, wait a minute, you're already talking about pain. Now you want me to focus on suffering. Yeah, I do. Mm. Because when, what most people do is when they think forward to the future, they just set goals, aspirations, hopes, desires. Right. Now, most people do that part incorrectly because I am a big believer that 95% of people protect themselves in the goals. They only set goals they know they can hit. So I think they're short-sighting themselves, but that's beside the point. Cause in this case, it's really about looking at two sides of the same coin. If we're going to go to the effort of understanding one bookend, why do we not understand the other bookend? If we know where we want to go, why would we also not understand what we want to avoid? Right. Right? So I'll give you an example. I have a 38 year old client. He moved 26 times before the time he was 18. Wow. He never lived in the same place twice. Never had the same set of friends twice. He bounced between his mom, his dad, his grandma, and his aunt. He never learned how to give or receive love. There's deep amounts of shame and abandonment. There's a nomad status that just exists in the way that he operates in the world. Fast forward to today. He's been married for a long time. He's got a beautiful wife and two beautiful girls. He understands that he's not the man, husband, and father that he's capable of being, who he actually is, nor that they deserve. And what's happening right now is he's got suffering in his life because the patterns that have moved forward in his life based on his emotional triggers have actually kept him stuck and have been inherited by his kids and his wife and his household based on how he was raised. Right. So he can sit there and understand that suffering for him is absolutely definitive, right? Mm -hmm. It's a life without his wife and daughters. Mm -hmm. So then he's got to go to the other side of it because in that case, he already knows suffering's already developed when he started working with us. Mm -hmm. And so he had to look at the other side and he's got this very vivid picture of him and his wife sitting on his ranch when they're 80 years old in Texas with the wind blowing through the brush. And the only thing breaking the silence is the laughter of his daughters and his grandkids. Mm. When he can take that image and burn it into his soul, the purpose becomes big enough to overtake the pains required for him to evolve, grow and change and heal his pain. So he can become the man, husband and father that he not only is, but that his daughter and his, and his, his wife deserve. Mm. The next step is that we have to understand the pains that we tend to avoid and learn to embrace them. So I'll give a personal example in this one. Okay. I already told you about my arm, my accident. I don't have a tricep in my left arm. I don't have a lat on the left side of my back. They were both taken for filler muscle right originally after the accident. Okay. To say that I have an imbalance in my body is an understatement for the last 30 years. Literally I'm completely stacked on one side. I've got a curve in my spine. I've got herniated discs that have all developed just because of the physical imbalance in my body. It is what it is. I'm not complaining when I say this 15 years ago, that pain that I was experiencing on a regular and everyday basis started to become debilitating. It was starting to become suffering because it was impacting my quality of life. Hmm. And so I learned that if I stayed lean, if I stayed active, if I kept my core strong, I stretched consistently and I kept my cardiovascular in good shape, then, Hmm. then I could mitigate that suffering back to a manageable everyday pain. Right. So what did I do? I did what every other person does when they decide they're going to go healthy. And I went and I joined the gym Mm -hmm. and I went consistently for 30 days. And then I stopped going right right? now. Here's the thing, because I understood what suffering looked like, because I'd already acknowledged the suffering I wished to avoid, which was the fact that I was having a debilitating quality of life based on my physical pain. Mm -hmm. It was not very hard for me to ask an additional question, but that's where most people stop because they haven't already acknowledged the suffering. They just have the hope and the desire. So it's not great enough for them to go deeper to be like, well, why is this process not working? Or they swip swap the strategy and tactics. Well, that gym didn't work. Maybe I go join the North orange theory. Maybe I go buy, join a cycle bar. And they just bounce between things that never work and aren't sustainable because they don't align at the bottom. Again, that's a strategic and tactical replace. And that's what most people think keeps them stuck is strategy and tactics. But I'm telling you right now, it is not. Mm. It's a combination of emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning. So I had to ask myself the additional question. Is it the pain of working out that I'm avoiding? Is it the pain of plyometrics? Is it the pain of stretching? Is it the pain of actually putting in the physical work to do it? Or is it the anxiety I get in the crowded gym? Mm. 
it was absolutely definitive for me that the reason I stopped going is that was not my environment for success. The emotional trigger for me training in that environment didn't put me in a place where I could actually be successful. So I had to embrace the pains required of spending the time, energy, money, and creating the space in my house to build out my own home gym over the course of the next couple of years so I could create the environment for me to be successful to manage and mitigate my suffering. The thing is, what we have to recognize is it's not always strategy and tactics. It's almost always an emotional trigger, behavioral pattern, environmental conditioning that's keeping us stuck and circling the drain in the same repeating patterns in our life. So the last step in this is that we have to learn to embrace this as a habit in all areas of our life. What we know from experts in habit formation is that there isn't, they even say this, which drives me insane, that there's an upfront energy tax, right? That there's a cost, that there's an expense. It's always viewed through that negative lens. If we're going right. to create a new habit, we've got to, we have to sacrifice something. Hmm. I want us to stop using that language because it already sets us up for failure. Right. Instead, I want us to view it as an investment in our future selves. If we recognize that the pains we embrace today will absolutely ensure that we can avoid suffering if we're intentional with where we align those actions and efforts, then we are not only get to avoid suffering, but we get to enjoy the journey along the way and experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment through it. That's where I believe we can unlock ourselves is by helping ourselves understand that our healed pain is actually what allows us to have purpose through it. It's amazing because it's like, I'm sitting here thinking, Oh my gosh, you know, there's this pain, there's that pain. I need to embrace and I need to go through it. And it just, you know what it is? It's really about people dedicating the work. It, it is. Because most people, they just go along with the flow. And, and yet it seems as though this is a mindset. If you know how to, you know, approach each problem or each challenges of pain with this mindset, you can have a much more balanced and, and joyful life. Yeah, I want to I want to challenge that word, though, because I get really tired in the personal development space around people just saying mindset, mental mm -hmm. toughness, because it's only part of the equation, dude. Like, right. it, it is absolutely critical, but it's only part of the equation. And I'll tell you from personal experience, because mental toughness and mentality were like literally all I did for the 13 to 15 years after my accident. And I built this intellectual narrative based around mental toughness that ultimately bit me. Right. Because I had created this narrative for the world that was, I'm good, I'm strong, I'm capable. If I set my mind to it, I can accomplish it. And by the way, I did. Right. And then I wake up and I'm all of a sudden 20 and I'm sitting here in this position and I go down in a pretty terrible snowboarding accident, re break my left arm, almost lose it again. No, <laughs> I'm sorry not to laugh, but that no, is. No, no. I mean, it's, but it's the truth. But over the course of 10 months, right? Like I, it became very, very clear that. People didn't show up, not because they didn't love me, not because they didn't care, but because they bought into my narrative that Brian's good, Brian's strong. He doesn't need our help or he'd ask. Oh. And in the time that I was one, in one of my most vulnerable periods in life, I didn't have the courage to ask for help. Hmm. And so I started to realize human connection was what really was important. And I really focused on vulnerability and authenticity because I believe that's the glue that binds human connection. Another 13 years went by. I had some other health stuff and I was focused so strategically and tactically on human connection, which I had mastered. But what I didn't realize is that when I shut off my physical pain, my physical feeling just simply to cope because of the amount of physical pain I was in back then, I also shut off emotional pain, hmm. emotional feeling. And I didn't start experiencing what that was again until my early thirties. And when that came back, I started to realize that human connection without emotion isn't really human connection. Everything I'd seen in the world was really a paled version of what it really was because I was confined in this box based on the narratives I'd created for myself. So I want to be really clear. It's not just about mental toughness. I think we're all hardwired as individuals to either lead with intellect or emotion. I think it's clear for us to understand that it's important to understand how we're hardwired, but that we both have both. Mm -hmm. The hardest journey for most human beings is the 18 inches between the heart and their head. Mm -hmm. So what we actually have to do is start to understand intellectual and emotional narratives and be able to balance and regulate it between the two to understand which one we can trust in the moment. What do you, which one can you trust more, the emotional or the intellectual? I think it depends on the situation. Truly. I don't, I don't believe that you can trust one more than the other. Definitely. I mm -hmm. think it's all contextual and it's all based on the situation of the people, but I don't think it's a mentality, right? I think that we've got to really understand that to do this, we've got to learn to think about our thinking, think about our feeling, feel our thinking and feel our feeling. It's in that mm -hmm. quadrant that success lives and our ability to actually understand and embrace pain. Because when we do that, again, we've lost the art of thinking. We've lost the art of feeling the narratives of our world literally shut us down from that. But when we can bring that back into the idea of understanding it's not just intellect or emotion, it's actually the beautiful integration of both, right? It's not black or white, which is what polarizes and politicizes everything in the world. The gift is in the gray area. And that's what I want people to understand.
Wow. And, you know, you talk about vulnerability as being a big part of this equation, not so much just like you said, this mental toughness, but embracing that other part of us. So many people have trouble with this. They don't feel strong when they tap into that vulnerability. Yeah. But why do you think that is? Because the narrative is the world, right? Mm -hmm. We're born as our brightest, burning, most authentic light we will ever be. And then from that point forward, parents, teachers, coaches, employers start telling us who we should be, what Mm -hmm. we should do, the things we should like right? You should do this. You shouldn't do that. You should be this. You shouldn't be that. You should have this amount of money. You shouldn't have that amount of money. You should drive this car. You shouldn't drive that car. You should be with those kind of people. You should not be with those kind of people, mm-hmm. right? Should and inherently is a shame-based word because it implies whatever we're doing isn't good enough. Right. Right. So from the time we're born, we're literally told who we are is not good enough. And we start going down this little funnel in this box based around all the shoulds until all of a sudden we're an empty vessel of who we once were. Guess what? That empty vessel is surrounded by armor. That armor is protecting us from what we believe vulnerability we can't show. But guess what? Here's the thing about armor. It gets heavier the longer we carry it. Mm. And so the truth is what we think is actually protecting us is actually slowly crushing us over time. And so it's truly about shedding the layers of what the world has told us, who we should be, getting back to who we already are, our most authentic selves, and recognizing that vulnerability and authenticity truly are the glue that binds human connection. You see, the thing is, is we as human beings are hardwired for four things in my belief. We're hardwired to feel safe. We're hardwired to feel protected. And those are not the same thing. We're hardwired to feel seen and and understood. And we're hardwired to feel connected. Hmm. Guess what? We cannot connect with other human beings unless these first three exist. These first three don't exist without vulnerability and authenticity. Hmm. It's very critical. You know, you say we need to feel safe. We need to be protected. And those two are different things. And, And how is that? I'll use a personal example on this one. My wife has always felt safe around me, right? She's felt physically safe. She's felt financially safe. Mm -hmm. But I had elements of anger that we only recently unpacked that never allowed her to feel completely emotionally safe. Mm. And so although she also felt protected physically, although she also felt protected financially, I was actually the one that was aggressive and not making her feel safe or protected emotionally. So I wasn't creating a space to protect her, Mm. right? So I was allowing my emotional triggers to cause me to react, which would trigger her, cause her to feel vulnerable and unsafe because of a heightened amount of energy that I had that I was unaware of. Mm. How am I supposed to protect my wife if I'm actually contributing damage through the way I show up? Right. So although she felt safe, she didn't feel protected in that way. And so I believe that we've got to understand these things, both emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually, right? So when we recognize that she did feel physically safe, she felt spiritually safe, she felt financially safe, which was really in that physical category, right? So we were covering a few of them, but she didn't feel the emotional safety or protection. So let's just call it 25% of who she was didn't feel safe and secure. So how was she going to lean into truly being vulnerable? My wife over 15 years, and I saw her more vulnerable than she showed anybody else. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until we had pure surrender, trust, and and understanding of vulnerability that intimacy also skyrocketed through the roof. And I don't just mean sexual. I'm talking from a human connection standpoint. The thing that was preventing us from being connected was the armor between us. And we'd been together for 15 years. Wow. That's amazing. Because, you know, you break it down so easily. But these are things that if there's trouble along the way, especially with the marriage, you know, you go to counseling, you try to work through that. You not that that was the level that you guys were at, but it's like most people go down these traditional paths. And by the way, we did do that. We've been in marriage counseling for almost five years. Oh, okay. It was only in this last year that we actually unpacked a couple of things that we hadn't seen clearly. Interesting. And and, and, and oh, by the way, we unpacked them on the tail end of us both believing that we were in the best place we'd ever been in our marriage in 14 years. Wow. Literally. Like legitimately the beginning part of this year, by by early March, my wife and I both would have told you we were in the best place we'd been in our relationship and our marriage in 14 years. And it would have been true. But I will tell you that the depth that we've been able to get to now in the last six months by actually unrooting, uncovering and working through this process has been unbelievably powerful. But it was probably two months after telling you that it was the best place in my marriage I'd ever been. I didn't know if I'd be married for another month, let alone the end of the year. And we had to embrace the pains required to actually go through the process to fix the damage and patterns that have been created over the course of 14 years together at this point. And, and it's only now that we're starting to realize that we truly can give each other everything that we both desire and that everything we ever wanted was right in front of us. But here's the crazy part. I almost lost it because of me. 
And I think that's what we have to realize is that everything begins and ends with us always. And so that's all I'm trying to get people to recognize is that when we recalibrate with who we are, we stop feeling like we have to justify who we are or validate that our voice is worthy of being heard. We can stand confident in that way. Then we can more properly set emotional boundaries for ourselves as well. We can give ourselves the capacity to focus on more healing because if we don't feel, we don't heal. So we've got to learn to actually process these things instead of shoving everything down like the world tells us to do and show up with a smile on our face. Again, if we keep doing that, the pattern is just going to lead to explosion after explosion after explosion, because that's what happens. When you bottle everything up, you can only contain so much pressure before it bursts. Guess what? My anger would burst. Right. Right. I wasn't processing and dealing with it because I was blind to the fact that I was angry. But how often are people blind to the fact that they have an emotional trigger that's actually affecting their lives and creating damage to the relationships in their lives? People don't realize, and it is because society tells us to push it down. And, and you know, large part of the uh, mental health industry, they teach you that. The whole drugs-related situation, it's ju- really just about, they keep saying controlling symptoms. And, you know, basically, it's just shutting off your emotions. It's tranquilizing. So this is one of the biggest pushes behind mental health today, and it has a lot of momentum. And clearly, what you offer is to me personally, much more value. Yeah. But I do want to be clear though, on one thing, honestly, because I, I, this is a debate and I just want to be really clear. I think there are plenty of mental health professionals that understand how to prescribe when there's a chemical imbalance that's not designed to just numb. However, I think there are a lot of people who just numb. And so your point is valid, but I want to give credit to the fact that like, I don't want to vilify drugs for drugs sake, because there are genuinely people who have neurological conditions different chemical imbalances that, chemi- that the drugs can help along this process. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. It's about proper prescribing and use of them versus numbing. And so I just wanted to give clarity because your point is powerful. Numbing is what we want to avoid because that's where suffering will develop. I agree with you. And, you know, coming from my background, I don't, I'm pretty radical when it comes to not believing chemical imbalances because I'm the one that they want to control in terms of chemical imbalances in developing, realizing my own authenticity and embracing my pain, yeah. I realized that this is also a narrative. It is. And by the way, that's why I want to be just careful in the way I describe it. Cause I'm not, I don't want to vilify one way or the other. I want to support all belief systems. Absolutely. And if somebody doesn't want drugs in their, in their body, that is okay with me. But what I also want to do is to not shame around drugs because I do believe that there's, and I don't, I don't think you were, by the way, I want to just make sure really clearly what I'm saying here is I think that there are people who are afraid to use drugs because they are afraid of how they might be perceived by having to use a tool to help them get where they wanna go. There are some levels of pain and there are some levels of things where using drugs accordingly as a tool are very effective. I would tell you that in my own general belief in my own body is consistent with yours, wherever possible, I don't want outside influences, but I'm also not going to shame myself if I'm in a position where I need them for for something as a tool or something to help me on my pathway. I just wanted to make sure for those listening to this that are using drugs, I just wanna make sure that you're intentional with how you're using them and that they're not there to numb. Use them as a tool wherever they are gonna benefit you on your path to freedom. You know, I, and I wanna make that clear too. And I try to, cause I bring up things to challenge the system, but clearly, and I want to reiterate this as well. And I have before, if people feel that they need to use these yeah. items to help them get back on the path, that's okay. And that's something that nobody should feel ashamed of. Right. And that, that was the only point of clarity because I'm all about challenging the system too. And by the way, there's a lot of misuse of drugs and a lot of misprescribing of drugs and a lot of numbing that's taking place. So the point that you're making in challenging the system, I 1000 agree with. I just want to make sure the fraction of people that really are using them for purpose don't feel shame based on that because it's not, it's not a one size fits all solution. Exactly. It's such a tricky thing because a lot of people who go to these psychiatrists to get the drugs, they are looking for answers. They are looking to better their lives. They are looking, you know, there's a, there's a quest there in some way. So that should also be supported and, you know, loved into being and, and a hope that people like you help change the views of others so that they know that there's options, that they can do it, that they, right. the power is within. And I feel like sometimes that's taken away when we say, okay, well, you have a problem with your system. You know, it's, it's being told that over and over when you say to yourself, no, wait, why can't I achieve what that person achieves? Correct. 
And that's literally all I want any in my messaging. I, if you hear, and that's even why I said, I want, I want people to understand all sides, all perspectives. And again, the gift is in the gray area. I don't believe that like in one way or another, there's almost nothing in this world that I couldn't argue both sides on, <laughs> right? Because like legitimately, I think that it's, there's validity in all sides to many points. It's about understanding the perspectives and where are we actually unified that's important. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we can at least accept and admit is that there's a lot of toxic shaming that goes on in our society yeah. around, again, the way people should believe, the way people should operate, the things people should do, the things they should put in their bodies or not on any of those categories. Those are the things I want to start breaking down is the external narratives that make people believe that who they are or what they want or what they feel isn't good enough unless it fits in the box the world is defined. So that's the narratives I want to challenge is allowing people to understand they don't have to fit the box. Now, do you encourage them to break down those ideas about what they have about other blocks in their lives? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a lot of what uh, our process will do is really to seek a greater amount of perspective and awareness around different situations. Mm. And it's about really understanding, like, how do we actually navigate through? So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and by the way, this is not a client and I'm not going to give any specifying names. It was somebody who reached out with an inquiry about coaching. Mm. One of the things, and I'll just give two seconds on this because it truly was like about challenging perspective and it answers your question. Ultimately he called, they've been, he was in a marriage. They've got five kids um, they have had a lot of toxicity, anger, and a lot of things that have taken place in their relationship. There was something that took place five to 10 years ago. I don't know the details because I was only on, uh, in this call with them for about 30 minutes, but ultimately it was something that was like almost a dividing point in their marriage seven, eight years ago. Mm. They repaired it. They ended up putting work through, but about two and a half years ago, the patterns kept continuing. And his wife at the time started having an emotional affair with someone else. Call it a year back. He then was accused of cheating on his wife, which he claims is not true. But he said, ultimately, what it's led to is now she's moved out of the house. She's in the process of wanting a divorce. And he's like, I know that she's going to just just flip on the whim and go marry this other person, hmm. not taking any credit or account for what he's contributed to the situation and the patterning towards it. He literally was like, how do I get her to come back? What do I do? And I said, if that's what you're asking me to do, like, you're not in the right place. Right now, point is, that wasn't what he was asking me to do. He listened and received. But ultimately, what I told him is I said, understand she's not feeling safe she's not feeling protected she's mm -hmm. not feeling seen and understood and she's not feeling connected to you for a whole variety of reasons you've outlined multiple different patterns she's now not only left the house but she's got divorce papers and what you're telling me now is the resentment and frustration that is going on is because you don't want to sign the divorce papers mm. she's likely feeling controlled fueled by your anger and your rage which is only perpetuating all the things that are driving her away so if you desire to have any relationship with her at any point, like you need to let her go and loosen the reins of what you're doing because holding on to her at this moment will not make sure that she is your wife forever. It will only make sure this is more painful and will develop more suffering in your life. Right. So if she's made the decision to move on, in some cases, as much as it doesn't align with you, you have to understand her perspective is that all these things you just outlined for me have only patterned her feeling less safe less protected, less seen and understood, and certainly less connected, yet she's found a place where she feels all those things. At what point do you let her go live the life that you say you want her to live, which is filled with joy, freedom, and fulfillment? And she's trying to tell you that that's not with you. Mm. Point is, is I wasn't there to help him feel better. I was there to tell him what he needed to hear. Right. And he surrendered through the call because of the way it was communicated, right? And he legitimately was like, oh, wow, I didn't even see it that way. I'm actually driving her further away. His own trigger, his own anger, his own control didn't even allow him to see the situation for what it was. Wow. And he was trying to hold on to something based in scarcity and his own shame that he might lose the one thing that he puts value on. And instead, what he's doing is driving her even further away. Right. And coaching there, it's not to say, how do you repair this? It's how do you process this to realize where it is? Because you have no shot of repair, given the fact that these patterns of art, she's already in the house. She's already filed divorce papers. It's not right. like it was in my marriage where we were in a good place and we decided to do the difficult thing so that we could be better. She's gone. Right. A lot of our coaching is really, truly allowing people to understand and see things from a 360 degree view and understand the role that they've played in it. Not to put fault in any direction, but to allow people to feel responsible for how things have patterned forward and understanding where they've contributed to it and where their reactions based on their own triggers have created damage that now requires repair before they can move forward. Hmm. So yes, it's absolutely about challenging their worldview. 
It's absolutely about challenging those narratives. It's absolutely about challenging even the belief systems they have on what they think and feel, which often are viewed through the lens of the narratives of the world. Mm, right. We have to get people to start viewing their world through their lens. Yeah. That's when we take back ownership and control and influence in our destinies. Right, right. It's amazing because, you know, you speak and recently stuff has happened to me where someone kind of gave me, gave me that information. Like you have to worry about like starting with you yeah. and, you know, doing that work and then things will move forward. And other things, it's so easy to look outside yourself and give other things that power. And yet when you speak, it's so obvious that it starts there. Here's the thing. I just believe that my truth gives permission, give others permission to live theirs. Mm. So I just speak truth. I don't come in trying to spin concepts. I'm not like developing these thought processes. These are universal truths. These are things yeah. that stoicism and philosophy and like we've been looking at from the human experience since the beginning of time. Yeah. So nothing that I'm saying is anything new, to be perfectly honest. It's just I'm taking it through my own lens and my own frame and my own filter. But it's allowing our own truth to give others permission to live theirs. Right. Right? right. So even what you just said is it's like, sometimes we just need permission. Wow. Right. So a story that I often will, will talk about is like, Oh man, one of the things that would happen in my shame is I would hear things through a defensive lens because being a husband and a father is the most important thing in my world. So my mm -hmm. wife would ask me an uncharged, totally innocent, neutral question. Like, Hey, what are we going to do with the kids this weekend? Hmm. And I would hear that through the lens of she's implying that I'm not doing a good, I'm not a good husband and father because I haven't done enough with my kids. And so what happens? I get defensive. Then it starts to be fueled with a little bit of anger. So then I respond and snap back. And I list off the 10 things I've done in the last 10 days that have demonstrated I'm a good husband and father. When at the end of the day, she just wanted to know what we were going to do to hang out. With right. The kids. <laughs> right. And so right. again, my worldview put me into a position where then she was on the defensive because of what I did to react in that scenario and how often do these things happen in relationships and life where all of a sudden it's like, of course, it's the other part because I was angry. How dare she imply that I'm not doing this? Right. Right. She wasn't. Right. My own view and my shame lens allowed me to receive it that way, which caused damage when it was a totally neutral comment. But again, think about this. Mm -hmm. We all have these situations. It's about normalizing the conversations around these and understanding that, again, the root of all suffering, I believe, comes in four areas. It's the things that are left unsaid. What we don't feel we have permission to feel or say, the things we lack words to articulate, or the things that are left undone. Mm, mm. Think about all of those things through the realm of like, if you're feeling jaded by an interaction with somebody, why don't you have a conversation with them? If you notice yourself get triggered and you're getting a little angry or defensive, just neutralize it by saying, hey, I don't know what, but something you just said triggered me and I'm feeling a little defensive and I just want to help make sure we can navigate through this conversation without me reacting. Just taking ownership of where we are right now and being able to say the things that need to be said that are the resistance and energy drain that prevents connection with the people we want in our lives. And I don't care if we're talking personal relationships, business relationships, philanthropic, community ones. It doesn't matter. It's all whenever you're interacting with people, which I would argue is pretty much full time. Yeah. Do you help people? who are, say, therapists or leaders in areas who um, affect many people in, I guess, the human improvement areas? I mean, yeah. do you do that for those people? The, ans the answer is yes. And I think that that's like what we realize is that, um, you know, in my one-to-one -one work, I, I have to be working with the leaders of the organizations or of the initiatives or of the movements or what whatever you call it, because then there's a trickle down effect. I am a big believer that the tone of organizations from a cultural perspective is, is driven at the top. I, I just believe that. I believe that when we scaled our last business to 15 million over the course of a decade, like we see it, we understand how these things like actually get integrated. And we've worked, I worked in risk management and employment of its consulting, working with firms as few as five employees up to over 10,000, largest clients being 5 billion. When you start to recognize that human capital in anything we do is truly a byproduct of leadership and culture, and the permission and the language and how we embed, embed and build that culture, it becomes really critical. So yes, we do that absolutely. Because when we go and work with an executive team in an organization, and we actually help them see themselves more clearly, communicate more effectively with each other, understand where each other's emotional triggers actually are so that they cannot recognize that although someone else's trigger isn't their fault, it could be their responsibility and the way they can help manage through it. 
-hmm. right? When we can communicate around these things, think about all the toxic shame that trickles down from the top as well. Well, guess what? If the leader of an organization is suffering from shame, how else do you expect an organization to operate? Mm -hmm. Yet it happens all the time. Right. And so we just genuinely believe like one of the healthiest ways is for us, our organization to not only work with people at the front lines, but you know, a couple of us on the team are very isolated, focusing with leadership. Mm, okay. So you have a team that goes in when you deal with like big corporate clients. We do. Yeah, we do. Nice. We've got a team of, we, yes. So nice. it takes, uh, I mean, when you're, when you're dealing with large organizations, there's different personalities, there's different connection points, there's relevant credibility with different people. There's trust with different people. And as much as I feel very confident in my ability to help a, a wide variety of people, I'm not the coach for everybody. And that's one right. of the first things I say to anybody that hires us is I'm there to validate as much if I want to work with them. Because if I don't believe that they're going to put in the work, if I don't think that they're actually going to help transform themselves, I don't want their money. Right. Like, I don't care. I like, right. I genuinely, we know that to impact a billion lives, 99.9999999999% will never pay us a dollar. Right. So this is much more about impact than it is about revenue generation. We know how to run a good business and attract the clients that the revenue will support our mission. Right. But the reality of it is, is like, I don't want people that aren't actually putting in the work to transform because that doesn't do any of us any good. It's just wasted time and energy. Right. Right. Well, listen, you're a fascinating person. I'm very inspired by you. I'm one of the nine. I'm one of the, the percentage points that you've... <laughs> impacted. And I want everyone else to find you. So how do people find you? Can you give us your handle, your website, anything that you'd like to share? Yep. Um, so I am at Bogert Brian on all social for those of you that like to go there. Um, I'm Brian Bogert.com is my main website, which has an overview of a lot of the things that we do. But if you go to I am no limits.com. You'll get an overview of our, a number of our entities, what we're focusing on, how we're doing it. And through that site, there's also a free offer for a course that we are actually offering for free for people to start asking themselves some of these questions. So if, uh, if, if you want a free resource, I will give full disclosure. Yes, we get your email. No, we are not putting into, into a, into a funnel. We are not trying to spam you. It is simply so that we can get you set up in the platform so you can have access to the course. Um, but I know I gave a bunch of handles there, but we're genuinely here to elevate and empower others. Um, we are not trying to drive people through funnels. And in our, in our personal development world in particular, we won't ever sell anybody. We just want to give an invitation for people to be a part of the process if they choose to invest themselves. Well, there's also a few different uh, price points too. I just want to mention to anyone who's interested because I bought a, uh, a lower price point and I'm looking to diving into it, but there's so much information on any approach that you take with these programs. It is really tailored for anyone who wants to start the process of bettering their lives. So thank you so much, Brian. This is, I, I'm so humbled and grateful that you were able to join us and to give your uh, words of wisdom and a, a incredible perspective on life. Thank you so much. I know our listeners are so happy to have you join us. Well, Jen, thank you for uh, creating a platform for me to be able to come and share my truth. And I just want to encourage everybody that's here. If you were moved by anything here, you're moved by any of the content. Uh, if it resonates and connects with you, what we know is that moved people move people. So please make sure, and this isn't for vanity metrics, but if you like, comment and share it, make sure that more people can be moved so we can all be a part of that collective impact to get to a billion. I guess I'm asking for help right now. Please, please help impact more lives. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Not As Crazy As You Think, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And remember, mental health is attainable for anyone, especially those labeled with mental illness. Until next time, peace out.